Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Monday, April 13th meeting of the Tuckahoe Village Board of Trustees. And would everyone please join me in the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And this is the first time I have said this in a very long time. Will the village clerk please call the roll? Trustee Quigley. Present. Trustee Luisi. Present. Trustee Afasi. Present. Mayor Eklund. I am here tonight. Thank you. Um, we note the absence of uh, Deputy Mayor Tom Giordano. He called me about an hour ago. He is stuck in Pennsylvania, um, and he wishes certainly could be here. So. <laughs> um, we have one presentation tonight, and I'm going to ask Mr. Frank DeMarco to come on up and talk to us about the uh, ever-interesting 2015 annual MS4 stormwater report for the <laughs> New York State DEC. Thank you, Frank. Testing. Testing. There we go. Welcome, welcome. Um, back by popular demand, I'm here to uh, speak about my MS4 application. Uh, you know, I'm forever being asked where roof water goes, rain water, toilet water, laundry water, kitchen water. Water meaning wastewater. But one thing is for sure, and everything must, everybody must realize that rainwater and wastewater should never meet. Those are two separate lines in our infrastructure that serve two different purposes. Wastewater, which is obviously uh, toilets, kitchen sink, laundry water, basins, in your home, travel probably through your basement out into the sewer lines that are in the roads. These lines are taken to our Yonkers sewer treatment plant, which is on the west side along the Hudson River. They purify this wastewater to almost drinking standards, 99.9%. Once, once this wastewater is purified, it's then released into the Hudson River, where it's safe for everyone. And then we have stormwater. Stormwater is roof rainwater. It's water that's collected in the street during rainy conditions. Along the curbside, you, there's big catch basins that are there to collect our rainwater in the village of Tuckahoe. We have 356 catch basins in the village of Tuckahoe. These catch basins travel through our infrastructure, again, in separate lines, and they travel to the nearest waterway, which is the Bronx River for us here in Tuckahoe. There are several, if you ever take the path along the Bronx River, you'll notice enormous pipes that never seem to have anything in them, but they sit, they sit along the Bronx River. But those are our... Uh, out off walls, which are these enormous pipes, and they carry our stormwater. This stormwater is inspected by me twice a year for any type of illicit discharge. And what illicit discharge is, is that anything that might be dangerous or contaminant that's emptied into these catch basins that's in the street will ultimately end up in the river and harm our waterways. So this takes me to our MS4 application. So that's what our MS4 application is. It's an it's a application with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And what the and, uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation just wants to make sure is that we're doing everything we can to protect our waterways. Because from the catch basins to the Bronx River, this water is not purified. It just takes its natural route. So they want to make sure that we maintain, we protect, educate, and uh, do the best we can to make sure that they're safe for everyone. You know, the catch basins that we have throughout the village have these emblems. And what these emblems simply do is educate everyone, telling them that that does go, anything that empties it into that catch basin does go to our waterway. There's also a number on each of these emblems. And we've uh, been very fortunate enough to GPS every one of these catch basins. 
tell us where they are, what condition they are in, do they need to be maintained, and most importantly, they're color-coded on our website to tell us exactly which outfall pipe this cat, that catch basin goes to. So with all this extensive work, uh, it, you know, it, it, we're very lucky to have all this information at hand. There were a couple of instances where we had illicit discharge, and uh, we knew exactly where the bottom, the end result was going to be at the Bronx River, so we were able to make sure that it didn't travel into our waterways. We were able to stop the solicit discharge before anything happened. And this was due to all the work of our GPS and this information that we've gathered over the past four or five years. This application uh, must be signed by the mayor. The copies will be located in the library, clerk's office, DPW, and it will be on the web also. Uh, just to tell everybody, we have questionnaire on the website um, that, that's in reference to our MS4 application and stormwater uh, within the village of Tucco. And I ask everybody to please go on and, and fill the questionnaire out for us. It helps us during our MS4 application. Um, and, and that's really it. Now, you see, you did make it interesting, Frank. And, and I'm going to ask you a question now. Um, let's say the catch basin in front of my house. If there happens to be a, a vehicle accident and there's gasoline and oil pouring into that catch basin. The information that we have now, actually, because of that medallion that's um, riveted onto that catch basin, it'll tell us where that actually will enter, eventually where all those contaminants would try to enter the Bronx River, I take it. Correct. My information on my GPS is a little bit more informative for me. Uh, like you specified, the number will tell me exactly where to go. Um, but we have all this information on our website. Uh, if everybody wants to go under the Department of Public Works um, stormwater management section, uh, we, we have mapping of our stormwater system. It's actually color-coded, uh, telling everybody where ultimately the end result will be at the Bronx River. And we also have uh, information on our, on our sewer, sewer mains. Cutting edge. Okay. Thank you. Frank, mm -hmm. no questions. Um, there, it, it, sort of inadvertent uh, pollutants such as runoffs from lawns that haven't been fertilized or have herbicides or pesticides on it or from some of the parking lots where the cars are dripping oil, things like that. That inevitably is going to end up being dumped into the river as well. There's no way of sort of screening for those kind of pollutants? Uh, no. Most of the, um, well, we were very fortunate enough to do the Fisher Avenue Park, which has the stormwater separator. And what that does, it separates all the contaminants that would ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, end up in the Bronx River. Also having a pervious pavement, so uh, rainwater will now travel through the surface of the blacktop pavement instead of running alongside of it into the catch mm -hmm. basins. So we're trying to eliminate any, uh, any runoffs into the river, especially from parking lots, because as you stated, there are many contaminants, oils, uh, toxins that are spilled onto the surface, and uh, historically that all ran into the river. Now we're trying to maintain it and keep it so we can maintain it. And, and how many actual discharges uh, <coughs> from the village? Uh, how, what's the number that goes into the, the river? We have seven outfalls. Okay, outfalls, all right. Yes. Would it, I mean, theoretically, uh, I'm sure it'd be expensive. Could you put that kind of a separator on each of those outfalls that you have on the Fisher Avenue parking lot? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Would, the, the kind of separator you have with the Fisher Avenue parking lot, could that be installed on these outfalls to do the same screening of the you know, contaminants? Oh, it can. It'll have to be large enough to handle the amount of water, the volume of water. They're pretty enormous. I, I imagine pretty expensive then. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Frank. Okay. Appreciate that. You're welcome. We have uh, two public hearings tonight. Uh, the first is public hearing number one, which is the budget hearing on the tentative budget for fiscal year June 1, 2015 to May 31, 2016. Do I have a motion to open this public hearing? So moved. Do I have a second for that? Second. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. I am in favor of that. Um, we have had many, many meetings over the last few months on our budget, as we do every year. And uh, this year, I'm actually going to ask our village administrator, David Burke, if you would just kind of give us a little recap as to where we're at right now. 
Thank you. Uh, I think what I'll start out with is a little bit of the recap of what we've done this year, where how we've got to this point, the tentative budget, where we are right now, some of the major changes. So even though it is April, uh, we're in the we're in the budget hearing. This all started back in December, um, where I put a memo out to the board of or my department heads, asking them to look at their budget request and, and come up with what they need to do in the next fiscal year. <clears throat> that was December and January. Um, one week in January, I met with each of the departments, myself and the treasurer, went through each line by line, asked them what they need, what they don't need, and kind of started to craft the budget. This, this all happened in conjunction with uh, a couple of work sessions that we had with the Board of Trustees, nothing that you guys don't know because we spent several hours on Saturday mornings um, talking about this. It, at that point, it was less about the line by line of the budget, but kind of maybe holistic kind of changes in our, our philosophy of where we want to go in the village. I know that I provided the Board of Trustees with a report um, about each department and kind of how those departments should look, either staffing wise and, and, and funding wise. So we weren't into the nitty gritty of the line by lines at that, at that point, but we were soon to get there. Uh, on March 20th, the tentative budget was filed with the village clerk, and at that point, it was a 6.09% tax levy increase. Um, March 28th is when we set our Saturday budget work session with the Board of Trustees, where we started to go line by line of the budget, and that's where we really got a lot of the work done. So <clears throat> where are we tonight? We're at the public hearing. Um, New York State law dictates that the public hearing needs to be open by April 15th, which we've done, and closed by April 20th. So if the Board of Trustees decides to keep the, the meeting open, the public hearing open, uh, a special meeting would have to be scheduled by next Monday to close the public hearing. That is a board choice, a policy decision that you guys can make after discussing the budget tonight. Um, the vote in the budget needs to happen by May 1st, or the tentative because budget becomes the actual budget with any resolutions you may pass at that point. So where are we? We were at the tentative budget was filed with the village clerk on March 20th with a 6.09% increase. This is a $443,000 increase, over a tax levy increase. This is the property taxes, this is nothing else. So that's a 6.09% increase. And how did we get to that point? It was because of total revenues are down and total expenditures are up. Our total revenue, this is before taxes. This is the non-property property taxes, is the building permit fees, the parking lot fees, the sanitation revenue, things like that. Those are estimated to come in nearly $150,000 less than they did last year. That puts us in immediate hole for this budget year. What also puts us in a hole for this budget year is we used fund balance last year into our budget of $150,000, something that we cannot do this year. So immediately we're almost at a $300,000 deficit in some of our non-property tax revenues. Couple that with an expenditure increase in the tentative budget of 2.5%, um, resulting in approximately $300,000, a little bit of, uh, a little bit less than $300,000. Some of the main cost drivers in that projection was some of the insurance issues that we've been having, um, an increased workers' compensation, and general liability. Those have gone up over $200,000. That, again, puts us in a huge hole right there. We've, um, to kind of stem that, we've gone to a new broker. We're out shopping insurances. Those, those are coming up. Uh, hopefully, we'll get more favorable pricing. But obviously, in the tentative budget, we needed to put some realistic costs in there and that kind of the, these are some of the, the increases, why there's some increases in the budget. <clears throat> also in the budget, just so everyone knows, is there's is, is capital money in there. So there's uh, $110,000 reinvested into the roads, so road resurfacing, some money into DPW and police equipment, so police vehicles and some other equipment for salters on DPW equipment. The budget, we had a budget work session on March 28th with the board and I met. We went through each of the line by lines, a lot of, lot of tightening on those lines. I know a lot of the board of trustees members went there and then we really kind of looked at all the expenditures, all the revenues and kind of made some changes. Uh, we talked about some long-term changes in the, in the long-term parking and the meter rates that were increased. Uh, some of the parking permit fees were increased. Some of those, some of those changes, uh, move that budget line from now to 6.09 to what you're going to discuss tonight. We're at a 4.98% increase in the tax levy. Um, there's obviously been some personnel issues where there's some personnel has been cut in some of the lines and readjusted. Uh, a lot of people ask uh, about the tax cap, if we're under the tax cap. Obviously, we're not under the tax cap right now. Uh, the New York State tax cap, the 2% tax cap is not the 2% this year. It's, it's 
it's 2% or um, in for rate of inflation, which is 1.68%. And that 1.68% in our budget means $123,000. So under the tax cap, our levy can only increase $123,000 if we wanted to stay under the tax cap. Obviously, with some of the insurance issues that we were having, we're not there right now. So as the board opens up this public hearing, we currently stand at a 4.98% increase. Thank you very much. That's a very good recap. Um, it's been a, a, every year is a tough year when you're working on your budget. And uh, when you have some of these uh, enormous cost drivers, uh, it pretty much puts handcuffs on us. So uh, we've done an awful lot of work just to get it down to the 4.98% this year. So um, with that, though, uh, this is a public hearing. So this gives an opportunity right now from anyone from the public who would like to speak on our budget. Um, is there anybody who would like to talk about it? I know there was a couple of people who came here tonight. Yes, ma'am. If you could just tell us your name, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Kathleen Skinner. I live at 14 Westview Avenue in Tuckahoe. And um, first, good evening, Mayor and trustees. Uh, as a longtime patron of the Tuckahoe Library, I'm here tonight. I know I've just heard all of these figures and amounts, but there are some issues that I'd like to bring up. Uh, I'm here tonight to request that um, you and all the trustees look again at the budget and find a way to hire a full-time adult librarian. It has been almost four years since the library has had a full-time person at this position. And the adult librarian is really a very important person on the staff. Among uh, his or her responsibilities are facilitating the book club and uh, the very popular uh, summer adult reading game, which draws many people to the library. Also, there's a new program uh, this year called Books and Coffee, which introduces our readers to current bestsellers. Uh, in addition to the adult librarian, the adult librarian is the person uh, to go to for any uh, reference inquiries, be they uh, by phone or in person. Right now, when the, when the part-time adult librarian is not there, uh, key members of the staff have to uh, take over and cover that position, which is not ideal as it takes away from their own uh, duties. So keeping this all in mind, I uh, thank you for your attention and um, for uh, giving special attention to this request. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming down tonight. Appreciate it. And Ms. Skinner, I'm not sure you mentioned, but uh, you are a member of the Library Board of Trustees. Correct, yes. Uh, for one whole month now, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hello. Um, my name is Antonio Del Vecchio. I live at 2 Consul Drive. Um, good evening, Mayor and Board. Good evening. Some of you may know me as... Carmelo Del Vecchio's son, who was a former trustee and deputy mayor. So I came to discuss also about the library and then also a little bit about my personal experience and why extending the budget would help, not just for the librarians, for the library, but also for the community. In 2012, I was what they called a learning ambassador. And that was pretty much a part-time job where I helped the children's section of the library. I would come up with crafts for and other programs for children who came in. And every day was um, a little bit of a struggle. We, once a week I had to prepare um, a new craft basis on different programs. A lot of them centered around issues with uh, the London uh, Olympics that year, because that's where big. Um, and one of the crafts was that I would make these medallions. And this is just an example. but. Every week I would have to work out of a, a small little closet and come up with something and scavenge around. And I would have to sometimes take my own money and 
put it in just so I could get extra stuff. And you know, the library works with what it has. Um, we do so much for the community. A lot of people come out and they like to bring their children. And for me, I grew up with the library. It was a learning experience. I learned reading, writing in some cases. I had some of my best childhood memories there because, <laughs> let's face it, I was in and out of there all the time. And even as a college student today, I still go back there and I study. And unfortunately, it's not open all the time, but I try to make the best with it. And just reevaluating, looking at the budget, because we don't work with much. And there's a, a lot that we could provide for the community. So I just wanted to share my experience what, as a personal worker at the library, what I've had to deal with. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody else like to speak on our budget? Yes, sir. Very friendly, familiar face, Mr. Paul Bryan. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, trustees. My name is Paul Bryan, Free Parker Place in Tuckahoe, and I'm also here in support of the library. Uh, besides everything else that you already heard, I won't you know, reiterate, I won't repeat anything. I will tell you one thing, that we also need this extra librarian as a backup to the director. As you know, the library is very important. When the director's not there, it needs support and someone strong. This librarian would do it. In addition to that, as you know, there are many activities in the library, and you need enough staff to be there. The library has been there for us. It's there for everybody. It's a learning tool. It has computers. For some people, don't have computers. It has any, any book that's there. It has reference books. It has tapes. If for some reason you can't have access to it at home, the library is there for you to rent it and enjoy it. And it brings comfort to many people that don't have the things at home. I have brought me today about 135 signatures that I ask you gentlemen to please put the library on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> have my mouth fixed, my voice doesn't work, to put the assistant director in the budget. It's a needed tool. It's not just something that's put there for dress. It's put there because it's needed. And I ask you to please consider this. May I bring the budget to you? Please do, yes. Thank you. Um, anybody else wish to speak on our budget? Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Brendan Fitzpatrick. I live at 24 Oakland Avenue. And uh, just like Antonio, I used to be, I was a learning ambassador last year at the Tuckahoe Public Library. And I feel like the community at the Tuckahoe Public Library is fantastic. There, excuse me. There are a lot of children's programs. And the, as a child who used to go to the Tuckahoe Public Library, I grew up going there. I think I went every day when I was six years old. And I still go all the time. And it's, it's a fantastic place. And all the different programs that they offer really tailored to a lot of different things. They have a Lego program. They have a excuse me, book club. And uh, there's also a teen garden that they have. And there are a lot of different experiences that you could just go to the library and it's a fantastic community tool. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Appreciate your comments. Anybody else from the public? And if, oh, yes ma'am, please. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Susan Kim. I live at 50 Columbus Avenue. Um, I actually moved here because of the schools, and part of that was also because the library is right there. I cannot tell you how important this library is for all the children that are at William Cottle, because the summer program actually encourages these children to read. They also have the reading ambassadors that really encourage this also. Um, the big concern I have is that if you cut the budget, or cut the budget for the library, or not put more money into this, that you're actually taking away the resources from these children. They need these programs. They need the children's librarian. They need the children's librarian not to be taken away when the adult librarian is not there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else? And I'm going to then toss it over to our uh, 
trustees, and we'll start with uh, Trustee Quigley if you want any comments on our budget. Uh, no, I just appreciate um, people coming out uh, often at these budget hearings. We have nobody who comes and says, this is great, this is community participation. And uh, I'm appreciative as a, budget, as a liaison from the Village Board to the library uh, to hear the different voices uh, from both inside and outside the library to, uh, I, I think, educate and inform the public as well as us and the board uh, as to the value and the importance of the library. So uh, our discussions over the budget, as you've heard from uh, David Burke, are not done yet. Uh, we still have some um, discussions to have in terms of what we're going to add or take away. And uh, I, I believe these comments will be very helpful as we pick up that discussion again. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Just for the benefit of the people that are watching at home, um, I want a question, and I don't mean to put anyone on the spot that came up and spoke on behalf of the library, but do you know how much money has in the budget for the library this year? David, four hundred and eighty thousand dollars is in the budget this year for the library. Does anyone in this audience know how many cuts were absorbed by other departments in this village? Okay, I just want to make it clear that we are not cutting the library budget. We've kept the library budget at its present level. As a matter of fact, I believe we increased the budget for their supplies, but we didn't acquiesce to their request for a full-time librarian. Very simple reason, we don't have the money. There are other areas in this community that is suffering from these budgetary constraints. And in my estimation, and as I've been saying since I've been on this board, are essential services to this village and before I would cut an essential service to this village, I would cut in a non-essential service to this village for the simple reason is the essential services such as are provided by our DPW and our police department provide a service to every resident of this community 24 hours a day in the case of the police department and in the case of our DPW workers five days a week when they're picking up refuge, recyclables, and when we have inclement weather, obviously the clearing of the snow. Just so that you know, we have not cut the library budget. Just for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Alfasi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also will echo uh, Trustee Luisi's sentiments. Uh, I don't believe I could say it better than he just did. Um, Certainly, we all understand the importance and the value of the library. We all understand that. Um, but we also understand that uh, we have to put our resources and those limited resources. And let me say for the record, I'm not real happy with this budget right now, um, but uh, with the increase in taxes that, that is projected. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'll leave my comments uh, for, for the night that we vote. Um, but uh, I think we've done the best that we can for the library in these tough economic times. Thank you. And uh, I'll uh, wrap it up here. You know, it's not, our, it's not a $480,000 budget. It's an $11 million budget. And um, the lion's share of what we're spending money on is, of course, our police department, our public works department. Um, and the library, of course, is a, uh, you know, close to half a million dollar chunk in the library. One of the um, points that I was really driving home during our budget conversations was that I feel that we, we as a board, we need to have a much better understanding as to who our library is specifically serving. I think that there is a, and I'll just speak for myself, that I, I believe that there is, uh, there's been a, a growing sense over the years that our library really doesn't serve the constituents of this board meaning people who live in the village of Takahoe, that there are that our library is serving um, people from Yonkers and people from other communities so you know then it we have to take a step back and say well is a library supposed to be for the greater good of all of Westchester County well if that's great then Westchester County should give us an extra million dollars and we'll hire a couple of full-time librarians well that's not going to be the case but I don't necessarily know that our library is serving people who 
only live in the village of Tuckahoe or only live in East Chester or live in Yonkers or Mount Vernon. So one of the things that um, I said I really want us to do is to actually have a system in place where we can get an accurate accounting of who is actually coming into our library and using the services. I think that the library is, I, I'm down there often enough where I believe that our library isn't, I don't think any library today is a library today that it used to be years ago. I think our library today is more of a community center. And I think that's a great thing. I think that the library serves all, all the programs that Mr. Quigley talks about each month. And if you notice, I'm sitting here writing some down. I think they're fantastic programs. But they're not people going there and checking out a book, taking it home for two weeks, and then bringing it back. That's not to say that that's a bad thing. I think it's a wonderful thing that people are actually going to that building, whether they're going to the library end of the building or to the community center end of the building, but they're going to a building and they're actually getting service. And in this case, we're talking about $480,000 that are going towards programs, not just books and newspapers and computer use. So um, it's my goal this year to get a very, very clear understanding as to um, we know what the library is doing because we hear it every month because we get a great report. Thank you very much, Trustee Quigley. Um, but we don't really, or I'm going to, again, I'll speak for myself, I can't say that I, I feel comfortable right now that, that uh, more than 50% of the people who are using our Tuckahoe Library are people who live here in Tuckahoe. And I think about that and I say, you know what? The people who are paying this $11 million in this budget are people who live in Tuckahoe. So I think it's, our resp it's my responsibility to make sure that if we're going to go ahead and take $11 million and some of that is going to be applied towards a half a million dollars towards the library, that it's going to people who are paying for it. So um, that's something that I, it's a challenge that I think that we really have to do this year. So when we're sitting here next year, we could say, you know what? We have the data, we have the research, and there was, I don't know, 5,000 people who entered that building and they spent you know 10,000 hours of programs and uh, of the 5,000 people, 4,500 lived in 10707, and that's information that I think is really important because if I, I think if we all had that intelligence, we would then say, you know what, <laughs> maybe we should give them a million dollars. I mean, maybe it, I think it would change the perception that we have of what we're f actually funding. So I think that's quite important. But getting back to what uh, Trustee Luisiano Fossi said, at the end of the day, it's all about a pot of money and um, what is our first, uh, our primary concern? Well, our primary concern, of course, is to make sure that when you hit 911, that there's going to be a patrol car at your house in very short order. That in addition to that, you don't have to hit 911 because our police department did a fantastic job in community policing to make sure that we don't have certain uh, crime issues that um, maybe some of our neighboring communities uh, might have. In addition to that, we hear all the time that our Department of Public Works is second to none. Our streets are plowed long before anybody else's are. Our potholes are being uh, uh, filled almost as quickly as I, would, <laughs> as I would like them, or as my car would like them. Actually, though, I have to say, Taco is fantastic. My day job is in Yonkers, and uh, between traveling from Yonkers down to the city and uh, back into Tuckahoe, uh, you know, my teeth are rattling around in my head uh, until I get to Tuckahoe. So, um, you know what? There's a, a sanitation worker who steps on my property five days a week. These are all things that when we ring doorbells during an election cycle, these are the things that people tell us that they want to keep going in the village of Tuckahoe. We hear it time and again. You know, uh, people say, hey, we know that we have to pay taxes. We know that we're going to have to pay an increase. Just make sure you're going to give us the quality of life and the level of service that you're providing. So I, I think that there is a, a big difference between raising uh, property taxes by 5% and not continually giving the service versus if you have to every couple of years 
uh, increase beyond this uh, fantasy 2% that the governor has imposed upon everyone, um, I think that uh, from, from where I stand, I don't want to pay 5%. Well, you know what? I don't want to pay 1.68%. But I can tell you this much. I am very pleased with the level of service that I get from the police department, from the public works department, from the administration in Village Hall here, and from the library too. So um, that's where I stand on the budget. So with that, we've heard from the public, we've heard from the board. Mayor, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Just one last comment. Um, I, I take all my colleagues' uh, comments about how to balance the budget <coughs> and how to allocate the funds very seriously, and we've had some very good discussions. However, uh, to say something to the effect that library is not an essential service of the village is both wrong and short-sighted and ultimately harmful, I think, to the overall quality of life in our village. We could argue about how to uh, fund the library and what service should, uh, the library should offer, but uh, I, I think in, in, there's no question that the library is an essential service of the village. Different than the police, different than the DPW, but still essential. And that's something that will be uh, considered, I think, in our further discussions. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Do I have a second for that? Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Uh, thank you very much. Our next public hearing is public hearing number two, which is on a proposed local law entitled The Local Law Concerning an Amendment to Section 8-1 of the Village of Tuckahoe Zoning Ordinance of 2001, thereof that would decrease the number of planning board members from seven down to five. Do I have a motion to open this public hearing? So moved. Second? Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. I'm gonna ask our attorney to speak on this just uh, in a second, but it's, um, the planning board has been a seven member planning board for oh, quite a few years now, maybe five, six years, I'm gonna say. And uh, 2007 is one? Yeah, that, it was always a five member board and I think it uh, went up to. Then it went up, to, it was five forever and then it went yeah. up to seven. And um, you know what, I, um, it was definitely a little difficult and challenging at quite a few of the meetings for them to have a quorum when you have a seven member board. So that's one of the issues. Um, and a lot of the larger scale projects that they were dealing with um, have now subsided. We do have a big hotel project that's on, on the board coming up. Um, but um, it's time to bring this back down to a five member board. And uh, we have some extraordinarily uh, qualified people who are on that board. So. Um, We've had two vacancies, and that gives us the opportunity to go ahead and solidify this as a five-member board. So did I cover the base right? You, you did, Mr. Mayor. And again, the, uh, like you said, the board is now down. Uh, there's five members on it currently. Um, so now we can bring the number from seven down to five. Um, and like you said, um, there's been a number of months where we were unable to get a quorum. And so we have applicants coming, and we're all here, and unfortunately we couldn't get the four members necessary when you have a seven-member seven board for the quorum. Uh, so now that we're going down a five, uh, five-member board, quorum would be three. Um, so it hopefully should be a little easier to get that quorum here. Thank you. Uh, does anybody from the public wish to speak on this planning board change? And if not, any of my colleagues on the board? And uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, I, I recall when, when uh, the board went from uh, five members to seven members and if memory serves me right the rationale was uh, more eyes on the board would help uh, make it more efficient and uh, have a diversity of uh, attitudes and a diversity of uh, experiences bringing that to the board I thought it was a bad idea then and I'm glad we're bringing it back down to five all right thank you um, if that's all the comments we have, then do I have a motion to close this public hearing? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. In favor. And that will bring us to the adoption of minutes, which is the approval of minutes of the regular meeting of March 9th, 2015, 
and the approval of minutes of the reorganization meeting of April 6, 2015. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eckling. In favor. Um, correspondences. Do we have any correspondences from the clerk's office? No, we do not. And do we have any correspondences from the board members? Um, you want to read now? Wait. 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 Do you want to read a letter? Right. Okay. okay. That's going to bring us to the first opportunity to address the board on anything on our agenda tonight. And we finally have some people in the room, so I'm hoping somebody has something to say. Um, anybody want to speak on anything that's on our agenda tonight? Okay, if not, then we're going to move to resolutions. Resolution number one is adopting a local law concerning an amendment to section 8-1 of the Village of Tuckahoe Zoning Ordinance of 2001, thereof that would decrease the number of planning board members from seven to five. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eglin. In favor. And resolution number two is approving the use of the Tuckahoe trolley for the Memorial Day Parade on May 25, 2015. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eglin. In favor. Resolution number three is accepting a donation from the Tuckahoe Eastchester Chamber of Commerce for the trolley. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor In favor. Thank you, Chamber. Uh, resolution number four is authorizing the issuance of a special cabaret permit and approval to Broken Bow Brewery for a band to play on May 16, 2015, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. to celebrate American Craft Beer Week. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number five is authorizing the use of the Lake Avenue parking lot from noon to 6 p.m. on June 6, 2015, for a motorcycle event sponsored by Growlers, Beer Bistro, and Empire Harley-Davidson. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. And we're going to have a discussion on this one. Um, I know there's a couple of folks here um, to talk about it, but I see Eric is here. Did you want to talk about this? Come on up. So tell us about this. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I'm Eric Lorberfeld. Good evening, Mayor Eklund, board members. Um, and I'm also with, uh, I own Growler's Beer Bistro, uh, and I'm with Randy Medina, who's with uh, Empire Harley. Uh, so we really just wanted to have an outdoor event. Um, and um, we, you know, we do Oktoberfest now every year, and it's been quite successful and fun for the, for the village. Um, and we thought that um, we would like to do something in the springtime. So um, Randy is a, a friend and, uh, you know, uh, he, he is the marketing uh, manager for uh, Empire Harley. Uh, we're also both uh, very friendly with um, a charity, um, Habitat for Humanity, uh, um, that we thought would be a good cause for, uh, you know, to raise money for, uh, you know, in the interest of having a good time, uh, you know, some outdoor food, uh, some music, um, some beer, local beer. Um, and uh, we just thought it would be, you know, a nice event. It, it would be limited to just 12 noon to 6 p.m., uh, one day only. It's not a full weekend situation. Um, but, uh, you know, we're very happy to talk more about the details. Um, you know, we're certainly uh, sensitive to the noise, you know, that would be uh, generated from the event and, you know, our neighbors so close at the Riverview. Um, and we, you know, we're trying to take that into consideration. Uh, you know, we don't want it to be a wild and crazy event. I don't think it will be. But, um, you know, we're going to do what we can to keep it under control. 
So in full disclosure, I'm a Harley guy, as you know. Um, been uh, riding most of my life. And uh, so I've been to some of the rowdiest um, motorcycle events, but I've also been to an awful lot that are very calm and tame. And it seems that uh, the older I get, the more I realize in the, uh, the environment that we live in in Westchester, it's definitely a lot different than, uh, let's say, in the Midwest or out on the West Coast and some of the uh, other larger bike events. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about, I guess, a motorcycle run that starts at the dealership and ends at Growlers at the parking lot. Is there a band in the parking lot? Can you give, give us a visual as to I'm, I'm riding my Harley with my wife and we pull into the parking lot and we're parking in the lower lot or are we parking in the upper lot? Get, yeah, so the, the idea would be that uh, we would put the motorcycle parking in the lower lot only mm -hmm. on the side of the median that's closest to Lake Avenue. And then car parking would be in the upper lot. Uh, and then we would kind of just use the area in front of Growlers to have, you know, everything we discussed. Uh, yes, uh, a band. Uh, there would be live music outside in the parking lot. Um, it would be a barbecue you know, an outdoor grill, uh, just hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be some uh, local breweries that might set up uh, a table outside. Uh, we haven't even really <coughs> spoken to them yet, but we're very friendly, obviously, with Broken Bow, uh, with Yonkers Brewing Company, uh, also Gun Hill, but, you know, it could be any one of those. And uh, so I'll, I'm going to let Randy describe a little more about the details of the Harley part of it because okay. there are some aspects to it that um, are specific to Harley. Great. All right, Randy Medina, uh, marketing manager for uh, Empire Harley Davidson and New Rochelle. Uh, what we're looking to do, what we want to do, we have a run that will leave from um, Empire Harley Davidson that would come to uh, Growlers. At Growlers, we want to have, like you said, the band, and we wanted to have um, some bikes on display. We also wanted to have a bike show so that uh, any, um, anybody that wants to come can put their bike up for judging. The, the entrance fees, which would go to Habitat, it's part of our ways to raise funds. So would the uh, registration fees for anyone who does the ride. Uh, as in addition to the bike show, we'd also like to have a um, what we call a jump start, which uh, the mayor may or may not know what I that is. I saw that out in Sturgis. It's a, um, yeah, it's it's a stationary uh, Harley Davidson on a um, basically on a drum that anyone can ride. As you don't need a motorcycle license, you just have to be over 18. You can someone who's either new to riding or uh, maybe he's been away from riding for a while, can get on there and take one through the gears. That's good. It, it gives somebody the feel of riding a motorcycle to decide whether or not they maybe even want to uh, buy a motorcycle, too. So a any idea how many people you think you may get? We're up against, uh, I don't think we'll get that many bikes Americade as far as, yeah, we're up so. against Americade, right. exactly. So. It'll be a, a small run. We're not looking to do a huge run mm -hmm. from Growlers. It's really more of the who we're going to pull in from the community. But um, we'll probably, if I'd say 30, 40 bikes would be a good run if we get that many. Americade is a huge motorcycle mm -hmm. rally that's up in Lake George that weekend. So most people that I know, will, well, a lot of people will be up there. So it may be a good opportunity to uh, you know, start small and, and uh, see how it goes. Um, great boot boost for your business and probably a great boost for some of the other restaurants too. I could see people, you know, uh, hey, let's maybe go on up and park on Main Street and maybe get a, a bite to eat at one of the other restaurants. No no offense to Growlers too, but <laughs> so I think it may be good for uh, just the overall uh, merchants in, in Tucko. So um, did have you talked to the police department about, you know, the logistics of, you know, crowd control and um, any policing aspect to this? Uh, yes, we have, um, and you know, at a minimum, we're going to be hiring at least one officer to be on duty uh, during the event from the time it starts until the time it ends. Uh, and actually, we agreed that we would uh, leave it open to the possibility of having more than one, depending on you know how many people are there. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Anybody else have any questions for? Looking I'm going to ask the chief to maybe come on up too. So thank you. I guess my first question being, um, yes, uh, oh. <laughs> I'm a four-wheeler, so that means I drive a car. Cage. <laughs> uh, I've always been supportive of your events, as you well know. My concern or 
what I'd like you to address is how, what do I tell the residents of that area about the noise factor from the motorcycles? You're saying 30 to 40, I'm gonna go 30 to 50. So what, how do I uh, calm their fears about that noise? Because I know Harleys do make noise, that's why you guys ride them, as opposed to the, uh, the Hondas and the rice burners, as they're commonly known. Uh, I don't even want to I and will that ride, that simulation ride also, will that entail noise as well? It is a, it is a running bike, yes. Okay, so we're going to have a constant din of a motorcycle, is what you're saying? Uh, on and off. Okay. Plus the band. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> For Eric, I think with the um, Oktoberfest, you provide us with the liability insurance. We're going to need the same thing from you. So Absolutely, yeah. Yep. That's good. Okay. Cycle. We'll go to Camille. Yep. Oh, um, if if I could. Yes, we'll just trust the Alfasi. Thank, thank you. Thank. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Are they going to need D uh, DPW as well to hire mm -hmm. the cleanup? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Let's talk. Let's hear from our uh, village administrator first. No. So um, the the chief and I have had uh, some conversation with Eric, obviously over email, and we've we met in the chief's office and went over this. Um, some things that we would definitely have to have is the uh, the police staffing. Um, up to the chief's satisfaction. So we'll, we'll talk about that. They would need the liability insurance, and they need um, certain other insurances through New York State uh, to have beer and alcohol a outside. Um, they'll also, in regards to the the parking lot, um, there is some question of of cleaning the parking lot afterwards to the satisfaction of the village and some of their other events. So it's something that we agreed that we would sit down with DPW, myself, and Eric, and figure out the best plan to make sure and ensure that Lake Avenue was in a in, in the perfect condition afterwards. So they may or may not need to have maybe one DPW guy, I don't know yet, but that's something that we would figure that we would discuss if approval. And you're okay with that, Eric? Yeah, no, we're, we're totally fine with it. In fact, what they did last Oktoberfest was uh, they were good enough to give us a couple of extra dumpsters during the event just to contain, you know, the waste. And, you know, we haven't talked to them yet, but that would be, you know, a good start for sure. Okay. Trusty Alfasi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Another motorcycle ride. <laughs> yes, yes, I do ride. Um, I think everyone took all the questions I was going to ask. <laughs> but uh, Trusty Luisi uh, and I are on, uh, on the same wavelength tonight. You, you, exactly what I was thinking about. Um, but I'll get back to his point again. Um, you came and, and told us that you were going to try to alleviate as much noise as possible. Um, but you failed to tell us how you're going to do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, to some degree, it's not totally within our control. But understood. Uh, when I said alleviating the noise, what I was really referring to was uh, the music. That you know, we could control the type of music, the volume of the music, the direction of the music. Um, when it comes to the motorcycles, I don't know how much we can do. All I can tell you is this is a destination event. Aside from the jump start vehicle, I, you know, it's, yes, there will be a din of motors running. I can't say that there won't be, but I don't see much else other than when the people come and go. Um, you know, there's certainly not going to be burnouts in the parking lot or anything like no, that. If, if I may, may make a suggestion. Um, and I appreciate that. And I think you're right. They're more than likely. Uh, they'll, you know, once someone arrives, they're going to turn off their motorcycle and admire it from, you know, a close but uh, uh, non-running motorcycle. Uh, but if, uh, you know, people won't start to say, uh, why don't you turn it on and let's hear it and let's rev it up a little bit, you know, I would hope that if it becomes a little bit abusive, uh, you might have some staff to walk around and, and say, hey, guys, you know, we, we, this is our first event. We don't want to kill it right here, and it'll be our last one. Uh, so, um, so you know, uh, when this comes to a vote, you will have my vote. Uh, it's a cautious vote, though. Uh, so let's see how it goes. Fair, fair enough. And uh, we do feel exactly that way. We, we don't want to mess this up. <laughs> we don't want it to get out of control. We don't want the noise to be an issue. 
So it's in our interest, too, to keep things quiet. Understood. And I thought about it, too, and I was thinking, you know, it's not like Marlon Brando and the Wild Ones where they're all riding in. You know, there's 30 of them at one time. There are actually, there's one coming in, maybe two or three coming in. Then there's none for a while. You know, it's not everyone riding together at one time. So I think you're going to have uh, staggered people entering as well as staggered people leaving. And, look, I, for one, um, if I were bringing my bike down there, I'm not going to sit there in the parking lot and and – and air cold Harley, which is not getting cooled and just melt away in the parking lot on that 80 degree day that I'm expecting to have very soon. Um, and you know what? Look, somebody's going to park their bike. They're going to stop and they're going to be rubbing it down because they want a trophy. Um, you're giving trophies or some kind of prizes. So yeah, that's, that's what happens at these things. I mean, it's, uh, it's more about the show than it is, um, than it is the noise. So, but I, I hope that we're all right here. So and, and also, it's a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. It, it, and, and, you know, I'm just thinking, I'm not a rider. Last time I rode a motorcycle was in Bermuda. They don't have Harleys <laughs> down there. Um, I get off the train at the Metro North Station, and I hear some roaring of the Harleys. I'm going to check it out. I might not know about it, but I get off there, and you're right across the street, and I'm hearing this stuff say, hey, this looks like a fun event. So, I mean, don't sweat the noise. I mean, everybody's getting a little bit, I think, um, neurotic about this whole thing. <laughs> it's a motorcycle event. It's going to be for six hours. It's going to be noisy. It's going to be fun. Uh, I've been to the Oktoberfest every year. They're noisy and they're great events. This will be like that as well. So, you know, I, my opinion, don't sweat the noise. Here, here. Way to go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, gentlemen. We'll just ask the chief to come on up and weigh in. Thank you. Let us feel that added level of comfort. What do you say, Chief? Uh, as we met in my office. You give it another wrap. <laughs> you never get through a meeting. I know. Who knew? It's still under warranty, Chief. Don't worry about it. Okay, uh, the gentleman did meet in my office with the uh, village administrator. We went through all the ground rules, um, very confident. As was stated, there'll be an officer um, posted at the event. Um, I think what the mayor said was quite right, though. These are not the you know outlaw motorcycle gangs that are coming to Tucko. Um, they're family events. They're having a jumping castle in the parking lot. Uh, it, it's a family event. It's 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. There'll be a police officer there to make sure that that the motorcycles that are coming in have legal mufflers and those types of things so that, you know, we're not folding up our enforcement tent and not paying attention to what's going on, to, not only in the parking lot, in the street as well. So, uh, you know, I feel uh, confident that, that it'll go smoothly and we'll monitor it. And if, and if it doesn't go well, um, we'll, you know, we'll know how to act uh, next time it comes up. Sounds perfect. Thank you, Chief. All right, we've definitely talked this one to death. So um, how about a roll call? Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. Opposed. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. And now we're going to go to uh, resolution number six, which is authorizing the use of the Marbledale Road from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on June 7, 2015, for a classic car and motorcycle show. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. And I know we have somebody here to come and talk about that. Pardon me? Oh, 5 p.m. you said. Yeah, that's right. Is that what it was last year, 5 p.m.? Ten to three, so it was five hours. This year, it's from eleven to five. Correct. So, tell us what is it going to be the same as last year? Talk, talk to us a little bit about it. <laughs> yes, it's and tell us who you are, please. Kristen Stone with Broken Bow Brewery, I'm one of the owners. Um, yes, it's the exact same thing, just a different time. Um, it was still with the uh, Shift Masters uh, Car Club. They'll be lining the street. And we will have six of the local restaurants in our parking lot, same exact setup as last year. 
serving food. We will obviously have some beer, water, soda, uh, I believe an ice cream truck again will be coming. It's really the exact same as last year. Okay. Um, time we're okay with? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm looking at our village administrator like, all right. Um, 11 to 5, I'm trying to, last year, what time did you wrap it up? Um, it was well, three. I think it was four. It gave us an extra hour last year. An extra, what, it was supposed to be a three? You got till four? Yeah. Okay. Chief, any reason why five, Chief, five o'clock all right? No problem. He's shaking his head. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, maybe there's something going on at four o'clock, and it's like, oh, my goodness, we don't want a conflict. So um, it was a great show last year. Great weather. I had a great time. I live on Marbledale Road, just walked right down the street. Um, beautiful cars, great um, uh, tunes that were playing there. So uh, it was just fantastic to be able to, you know, get a burger and go inside and sit down with my son. You know, I thought it was so cool to sit in a brewery, and he's allowed to do that, just sit there while I'm having a beer. Very neat. Um, great show, great weather. I wish you all the success. And, again, you're paying for police officers. You'll work that out with the chief as to how many. Um, and what about Department of Public Works? Did we have any litter issues? I'm looking at Frank DeMarco. He's, nope. Okay. So. All right. So um, insurance is on file? Yeah, Wheels of Time has the insurance. Wheels of Time? Wheels of Time has the insurance. Okay. And they'll file that insurance with us. And, um, yeah, she doesn't have it yet, but just make sure you get it. So, good. Hopefully you have great weather. That's what it uh, all boils down to. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank just you wanted to encourage everyone at home to please leave your cars, your vehicles at home, walk, have a couple of beers, walk home. <laughs> Thank you. It was a nice day. <clears throat> all right, that's going to bring us to a roll call on this. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Well, we didn't rake them over the coals as much as we did the Harley people. <laughs> okay, resolution number seven is authorizing the mayor to sign the 2015 annual MS4 stormwater report for the New York State DEC. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. In favor. Resolution number eight is declaring municipal equipment as surplus and authorizing sale of said equipment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number nine is authorizing the mayor to sign a consulting agreement with CPI-HR effective March 1, 2015 until February 28th, 2016. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number 10 is authorizing the mayor to sign an addendum to the license agreement with the town of East Chester for the use of the Senior Nutrition Center at the Tuckahoe Community Center. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. And we are told that this is most likely going to be, and we believe it is, going to be the very last extension. So we look at Mr. Galuzzi and tell him, get ready for an empty community center coming up in the fall. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. And resolution number 11 is authorizing the village clerk to issue a peddler's license to Sean Capiello, doing business as Good Humor, to sell ice cream and candy for a period of six months. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. And discussion. I have a question. Um, good Humor Truck. I know we have uh, historically not issued any peddler's licenses for many, many years. But I was talking to my wife, and she said, she believes that there was a good humor truck. We did. We had a good humor uh, truck. How long ago was that? The paper back, the back of paper I gave you? I don't. We had, I believe her name was Nikki, and she did it for three or four years while I was here. And then she 
gave up the business, and then no one really approached us to, to start again. How many years ago was that? Do you remember? I'm thinking maybe 2008. When we issue a peddler's license, does that allow them to pretty much peddle any street in the village? Or do we ever restrict it to like only in front of the parks or? Now I'm, talk I'm looking at our village yeah. attorney for that. <laughs> Since we really haven't had any, right? Um, I just don't know if the board's ever restricted these things in the past. Um, I don't see a re reason why you can't restrict it. Um, well, I guess for, for one thing, if I was going, you know, I, I guess I'm okay with a good humor truck ringing the bell in front of the park on a on a summer afternoon. You know what? Um, but I'm definitely not okay with a good humor truck parked out in front of Carvel ringing the bell. Sure, sure. So um, I don't know. <laughs> Well, these restrictions here, there are, there's restrictions, I believe, in place. There is nothing in here at all. It just says to issue a peddler's On here. Oh, in the our uh, agenda from our workshop. No stand, not stand or permit the vehicle used by him to stand in one place, in any public place or street for more than 10 minutes. Is that part of our code? Yeah, this so, is 17-9 uh, right. of the village code. Um, so if we issue this license, he has to adhere to these provisions. Absolutely. This would be, this is what you're issuing the license under. Not blow a horn, ring a bell, or use any other noisy device to attract public attention to his wares. Not sell any ice cream within 250 feet of a school between 8 and 4 on school days. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't believe I have a copy of that with me, but um, is there a time restriction on there? It. Um, just just a school. They they they're not allowed to do it within 250 feet of a school from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and if we well, we can make a friendly amendment right now because I'd like to have a restricted uh, time frame. Uh, I I prefer good humor not to be um, running be the streets dark. at yeah, it be midnight dark, right. or even <laughs> after dark. I would say. But I, do we then have to change 17-9, or can we just make it an amendment to this resolution? Well, I, th I think you can uh, put a condition on the license. A condition on the... I think, I think that would be the prudent way to go right now. And then we can look into the, uh, the code at another date, but at least this one's in front of you now. For a period of six months between the hours... of dawn to dusk or what what would we say it's up to the board if that's when um do you want to put in a specific hour there or dawn to dusk whatever you, you may want to put a specific hour there yeah that you're leaving out the discretion of yeah that's true somebody, somebody who's going to say they can fight about what time if it was dark or not. Chief correct. is laughing at me over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those poor little kids are going to line up at 8 o'clock and it's still light out. <laughs> um, I, get their ice cream. I, I think, yeah. I think uh, I'll throw out a re uh, what I think is perhaps a reasonable time, uh, 8 p.m. What do you think, Chief? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. Note to self, replace all the batteries on these bikes. Just talking about past experience, as the village clerk said, we had a humor truck here for several years, up until about three or four years ago, I believe. Um, they're out when the kids are out. So I, I, I don't want you to think you have to overthink it. Okay. They're not going to be out at midnight because they sell to children. They're not going to be out in front of Carvel because it's competition. They're going to be where the kids are at a playground and they don't, the parents don't want to drive them or walk them to Carvel. So if we're just going by past experience, it really has not been a problem as far as competition with local merchants. It's a very seasonal um, opportunity, weather-related, during the daylight hours when you know parents are out at the playgrounds with their children. So past experiences there there was not a need to restrict it restriction. you know we're talking about a good humor truck not to say in the future that you want to tighten up the law for other peddlers that certainly would be a consideration but for this particular um, item on the agenda 
I don't think it's necessary, it's necessary to overthink it in this particular case. Got it. I guess I'm still in that Harley Davidson torturous <laughs> mode. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll keep it as is and we'll just take a, a vote on it. Roll call, please. Trustee Quigley. Yeah, I'm going to oppose uh, on two grounds. One is that we have not allowed this in the past with other food vendors, mobile food vendors, and I think this would be inconsistent to approve this um, as opposed to when we disapprove, say, sandwich trucks. And secondly, uh, in this era where we see an obesity epidemic, I think the last thing the village needs to do is to sanction or encourage easy access to junk food. So for those two reasons, I'm opposed. Trustee Luisi. I'm going to echo what my fellow colleague, uh, Trustee Quigley, said, and I'm going to add, I think that for a $200 permit fee that he is going to uh, pay the village, we're losing sales tax revenue as he's going to keep all the money that he makes thereafter. And as we have consistently done since my time on the board, I've always voted against these type of peddlers. And uh, once again, regard, I, I appreciate what the chief said, but I think we're taking revenue away from our local businesses, whether it be the Carvel or Nikki's Deli who's selling uh, froze fruit, so I am opposed. Trustee Alfasi. I'll tell you, this is a tough one for me. Um, That's because we have kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, you know, a good humor truck or any uh, ice cream truck is part of Americana. Um, it's part of uh, growing up, you know. Dad, mom, can I have a couple of dollars? I hear the ice cream truck. Um, I'm going to vote in favor. And me too, but I think that's going to be a split vote, so that means it doesn't happen. If, am I correct on that? Correct. So, okay. Resolution number 12 is a resolution to amend the schedule of rates for all long-term meters, more than four hours, located in the village of Tuckahoe as follows. The amount of time allocated, 25 cents coin for 20 minutes, $1 coin for 80 minutes, $7.25 all day. Cash key may be used for all day parking. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. In favor. Resolution number 13 is designating April 24th, 2015 as Arbor Day in the village of Tuckahoe. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor in favor. This one I love. Uh, resolution number 14, <laughs> accepting a donation in the approximate value of $7,900 from New York Ladder and Scaffolding Corporation for services, scaffolding services, right outside that window here at Village Hall. Do I have a motion? I, I go ahead. I would just like discussion though, please. Sure. Uh, second? <laughs> second. Oh, I need a motion first. We need so move. Okay. Second. And discussion. Um, who is this New York Ladder Company, and what, what do they have the business uh, donating stuff here? Well, in the interest of uh, ethical full disclosure, it happens to be the company that I own, and actually has now I'm going to get that opportunity to plug my family business. There you go. Uh, established in 1894, one of the oldest businesses in Westchester County, third generation business of which I am the very proud owner, um, and very. Uh, uh, proud to say that uh, my grandfather started this business. My dad and my uncle, both lifelong Tuckahoe residents, uh, operated the business for close to 50 years. And I've been the proprietor of the business since the day Chief Costanzo and I graduated high school. Um, and uh, so I'm very pleased and happy to go ahead and whenever we can uh, to go ahead and donate our service for the benefit of people who have helped my family for all the years we've been in the village. Um, Mr. Mayor, in the future, I will not ask any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. Fortunately, I'm out of that Harley's frame of mind. <laughs> in favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Very much in favor. <laughs> <laughs> A resolution number 15 is authorizing the approval of vouchers in the amount of 541000 $125.87. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. 
Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number 16 is authorizing the mayor to sign an employment agreement with Robert J. Fells. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number 17 is appointing a seasonal accountant. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Trustee Quigley. In favor. In favor. In favor. In favor. Resolution number 18 is authorizing the mayor to sign an employment agreement with David Burke. Do I have a motion? Excuse me, Mayor. We added on to that. Oh. Uh, authorizing, sorry, authorizing the mayor to sign an appointment agreement with David Burke and authorizing him as signatory on all bank accounts. Thank you. You sure? <laughs> On all bank accounts. Okay, do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. And now I'll have a little discussion. Um, so what have we done here? We have had a resolution to sign an employment agreement with Robert J. Fells, and I'll explain who he is, um, a seasonal accountant, and David Burke, we all know is our village administrator. Um, I have decided, and one, uh, one of the items that a mayor uh, does when he is reelected or elected is he appoints uh, certain key individuals, and he has the authority to appoint a village clerk. And I was very pleased to appoint Camille DeSalvo as our village clerk. Um, I made a decision that I was not going to reappoint our treasurer, John Pintos, as the village treasurer. So. Um, Instead, part of a uh, larger plan that's been uh, actually put in place for a while now, um, which incorporated Mr. Burke as our village administrator. This all started last year. Um, we are, uh, I'm pleased as punch that we are actually moving in the direction of providing a much stronger treasury department in the village. We hired a gentleman by the name of Ryan Ruetta who has worked out fantastically. He is our deputy treasurer. He's been on board for quite a while now. Um, but in the process, in order to hire a new treasurer, what you must do is you have to let your current treasurer's term expire, which has occurred. Then you have to have, you always have to have a treasurer. So what we've done is we've actually engaged Mr. Burke as our figurehead interim treasurer. He gets paid a dollar a year, a dollar a week, or a dollar a year for that role. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we have on the agenda here an employment <coughs> agreement with Robert J. Fells. Uh, Robert J. Fells was the treasurer for the village of Bronxville for about 30 years. He retired last year. We called on him and asked him if he would step in and help us kind of reorganize our treasury department, bring us uh, maybe a little bit closer to uh, the 21st century that we would like to be, and uh, also help us, which is very important, help us in uh, the interview process and selecting a new village treasurer. Our goal is to try and find a village treasurer. So this is out there for anyone who uh, hears this. We're looking to hire a village treasurer from uh, maybe a deputy treasurer from another municipality, sort of like we hired Mr. Burke. He was a deputy village administrator from another municipality. Great opportunity for him to take the top job here in Tuckahoe. We're looking to, to do the very same thing with the treasury department here. So um, with that, the county requires us to go ahead and make sure that we have all these positions in place, which we've done tonight. And over the next two months, we are looking to have a brand new treasurer in place who will have a excellent deputy treasurer to work with, Ryan Ruetta. And um, that's, uh, a, it's been a goal of all of ours for the last year. And we're thrilled that we're finally able to put all these uh, steps in place. So that's my discussion on that. And a roll call, please. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number 19 is appointing a seasonal deputy village treasurer. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor. Resolution number 20 is approving the Shiloh Baptist Church use of the following streets for their third annual 
uh, Val Walk on Saturday, April 25th, 2015, in loving memory of Valeria Murray and in support of all those affected by cancer. The walk will start at 8 a.m. starting at Shiloh Baptist Church. It'll travel the following streets, Marbledale Road to Fisher Avenue, down to Columbus Avenue, down to Main Street, Yonkers Avenue, Garrett Avenue, Armour Villa, Main Street, Marbledale Road, and then back to the Shiloh Baptist Church. And they will be providing us with li liability insurance for this event. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor Eklund. In favor, very much. Um, that's going to bring me to some appointments that I will be making. Uh, first is appointment of John Palladino to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a term to expire April 1, 2020. Do I have a motion for that? So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee in favor. In favor. Uh, the second appointment is the appointment of Ray Nuremberg to the planning board to fill the unexpired term of Eric Fang, which is expiring on April 1, 2016. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee In favor. Trustee In favor. In favor. Resolution number three is the appointment of Eric Fang as an ad hoc member of the planning board for a term to expire on April 1, 2016. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. I want to thank Eric. He's uh, actually taken on some uh, teaching uh, responsibilities in his professional life, and I think that's wonderful. So he has uh, agreed to, when he can, to fill in as an ad hoc member on the planning board. He's been a uh, full-term member, so um, we're very happy that he's going to stay on board, a very talented person. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. Mayor In favor. Re appointment number four is the appointment of David Burke as our village treasurer for a two-year term. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. For a whole dollar. Enjoy that dollar. <laughs> Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee in favor. In favor. In favor. Thank you, David. Uh, appointment number five is the appointment of Ryan Ruetta as deputy village treasurer for a one-year term. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luis. In favor. Trustee In favor. In favor. Appointment number six is the appointment of that very friendly face of Jackie Ferretti, who we all see when we go to the village clerk's office. Dap uh, Jackie is being appointed as our deputy village clerk for a term of one year. Congratulations. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Trustee Quigley. In favor. Trustee Luisi. In favor. Trustee Alfasi. In favor. In favor. Um, we have added a new item in our agenda, which is called discussion items. And tonight what we're going to be talking about is... Uh, modifying the term of office for the mayor and trustee from two to four years. Uh, this is something that we have been discussing for a while now. Actually, it's something that's been discussed for all the years I've been on the board. Um, we want to open up this conversation for a meeting or two before we actually uh, pass this. Uh, there's Every year, whenever we have this conversation, there's always a concern that it's self-serving. Um, it, do we do it, and does it affect the, the group of individuals who we're talking about? Um, we all recognize that it's a good thing to actually get new elected officials in a community to start off on a four-year basis rather than a two-year basis. As we can all attest to, it takes you two years just to figure out the code for the men's room, I think, sometimes around here. I mean, there's an, there's By the way, what is that code? <laughs> can't tell you. <laughs> you need two more years. <laughs> um, there's so much uh, that is, uh, especially in today's time, um, there is so much that you have to learn, and uh, this is more for the next generation of elected officials that somebody who's going to actually take office, they don't have to go ahead and on their first day of office start to think about, like so many other political figures have to, about um, re-election of uh, their next term. So this allows a trustee or a mayor or, a well, a judge has always had a four-year 
uh, term to go ahead and actually take the job, kind of take a deep breath and not have to be burdened with the whole concept of am I only going to be here for two years and should I be maybe trying to do something or accomplish a particular project that they were thinking about because they're not going to be here uh, to actually see it through. Four years definitely gives somebody that opportunity, that time opportunity to start and finish something. And it gives the, uh, having, uh, without having term limits, it gives the voters in our community always have the opportunity to boot us all out of office if you don't like this. So um, this, again, it's, uh, it's an issue that, is, uh, that certainly has bipartisan support uh, on this board. We've uh, talked about how we do this um, how do we accomplish this? There's been an awful lot of research done from our legal and our village administrator um, to get this accomplished. And uh, so there's a timetable for this. There's also a cost savings for this. Eventually what will happen is if this does pass and our elected officials operate on a four-year term, that means that every other year there will be no village election, which means that there will be no cost for a village election. Um, and there's, if you look at our budget, there's a line item in that budget for the cost for the machines, for the, we have to pay all the poll workers to actually do that. There's a cost in the clerk's office to uh, run the election. And um, we're all very familiar with the lever machines and we all know that the uh, long, uh, long term for the lever machines is not, uh, there's no certainty for that at all actually. So the cost of running an election is at some point going to be outside of our control because it's going to be run by the county. So uh, having an election every other year certainly saves in that cost. So I uh, took some notes and I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the timeline for this. So here we are tonight. It's April 13th. Um, we're opening up the discussion on this. My colleagues are going to talk about it. Uh, anyone from the public can actually, uh, I'm going to ask them to talk about this. Our next board meeting is May 11th. We're going to continue the conversation there. Hopefully people will see this on our cable channel or, uh, or see it on our website and uh, we'll post it there because we want the people to understand clearly what we're doing so they can weigh in. Uh, most people that we hear from, they think it's a great idea and that it should have always been that way. But who knows, maybe 1,000 people are going to say we're crazy and, and we shouldn't do this. Um, at our June 8th board meeting, we're going to keep the uh, conversation open and then we're going to pass it, or we're going to have a resolution. I shouldn't say pass it. There'll be a resolution on adopting this as uh, becoming permanent. And what will happen at that point is it opens a 30-day window for what's called a permissive referendum filing which means that after we pass the resolution and we've, in essence, changed policy, then there is a 30-day window for people in the community to go ahead and sign, get petitions to sign to say that they want to go ahead and rescind that resolution that we had. So if that does not occur, then this matter becomes final. So how it would work if it were uh, adopted on the timeline that I just talked about is in next year's election, 2016, and I want uh, council just to <laughs> verify that I'm accurate on this, because um, the research that I have is that in 2016, there would be a three-year cycle for the two trustees. Then in 2017, it would go to a four-year cycle for two trustees and whoever the next mayor would be. Then in 2018, there would be a three-year term for the judge. Then in 2019, we get into the cycle, which is a four-year term for two trustees. 2020 is the first year there is no election at all. 2021, four-year term for two trustees, one mayor and the judge. And then in 2022, no election. And then it just repeats itself. And our village attorney is nodding his head. So, okay. So um, that's what we're talking about. And is there anybody from the public who wants to weigh in on this? Any thoughts? Yes, sir. Hey, Anthony Fiore, Bidman Place. Is there any chance to change the, the election from March to November? Is there any talk of that at all? 
Um, it's yeah. something that's been kicked around also. Yeah. Good. It's a very good question. Um, one of the reasons why villages have elections in March is because the theory is that a village is a much smaller populated community yeah. than a city or a town. Yeah. And um, we like to believe, and I do believe, that um, village politics and village issues are smaller and they're local versus if a village election is on a November ballot, yeah. uh, let's say during a presidential election, uh, the entire yeah. slate is swept away by yeah. maybe a very popular Republican or a Democratic yeah. candidate. And that may not necessarily be what the, okay. you know, the residents are really looking for. All right, just um, keep it in the March election. Okay. Yeah, that's, that was it. it's been kicked around yeah. an awful lot. And the, the whole thought process is yeah. it's, it's really best yeah. for people who live in a small community, yeah. like a village. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep still keeping the... The old voting machines or have to go electronic next year too? We're, we try to keep them as long as we okay. can by law. Um, we get, we've had a few extensions on that, but at a certain point in time, um, we will not be able to keep those. Yeah, because I work for Lakeland, so next, this is the last year we could use the lever. Next year, the school district has to go to electronics. Yeah. So they got a big line on them just for that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. You see the expense. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That was it. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this topic? And if not, have any of my colleagues on the board here? Maybe I covered it all. <laughs> Actually, you, you covered it quite thoroughly. Um, I'd be interested if there is uh, a turnout from in the public and what their views are. So uh, obviously we'll all withhold judgment until that point. And I think, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, David Burke, the administrator, did some good research and we found out that the four-year terms are not uh, are actually are consistent with a number of other municipalities, uh, particularly the town council of East Chester. Uh, each of the council members is on a four-year term. So uh, it's nothing terribly radical that we're discussing here, but I'm going to hold off and to see what the public says. Very true. Thank you. Anybody uh, else? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I hope that we will continue this discussion. Um, certainly, I think with a four-year term, um, also included in the discussion needs to be uh, the possibility of term limits. Uh, we haven't really dis discussed that too thoroughly. Um, I, generally speaking, uh, am opposed to term limits. However, if we look at the State Assembly, we look at members there, look at the State Senate, um, it's a bad idea whose time has come. Um, so I'm in favor of term limits for the uh, higher offices. Perhaps it's not necessary here on a local level, but it's certainly something I think we should discuss. Absolutely. It's all on the table. That's why uh, I'm glad we're finally having the big conversation about it. Um, so that's going to bring us to our departmental reports to the board. And as we always do, the chief is saying no, nothing from the chief. Um, Frank, boy. Oof. Mr. Galuzzi. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. <laughs> Board. Uh, this coming Friday, the 17th, from 6.30 to 9, please stop by the uh, community center. Uh, the Girl Scout Silver Award recital, uh, it's called Dance for Awareness. It's brought to you by the East Chester Girl Scout Troop 2059. They're having a benefit for ECAP. Uh, it's $10 admission. And you have to also bring a canned good. Uh, all the uh, proceeds will go to uh, ECAP. That's this Friday the 17th. Uh, next Monday, I know it's next next month. I want to bring to everybody's attention, there may be kids watching or parents that have some uh, kids that are into hobbies. Uh, Saturday, May 16th, from 11 to 5 at the Community Center, uh, the Westchester Comic and Collectible Show. Admission is free. Uh, come out and check out the video games and systems. Uh, plenty of rare comic books, magic cards, toys, and mad magazines. Uh, so if you're interested, come on out. It's just some of the events we're, we're doing at the community center in the next month or two. Uh, also, uh, open gym is still Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for all you kids listening from 3 to 4. So come on out and enjoy the uh, new rims, uh, new basketball rims and nets we put up. Uh, community center is, uh, is looking good in that regard. 
So I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of an update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Kudos, John. Kudos for the um, Easter egg hunt at Parkway Oval, by the way. Boy, yeah. I think it went very well. Um, Gary, did you have anything for us? Um, yes. Well, I, I think this is the time that I can discuss the fast food issue. Yes, please do. Mm -hmm. So basically what's happened is there, there's a uh, subway application. Your mic. Yeah, pull the mic. Okay. There's a subway application in front of the zoning board right now. And what's before the zoning board is, a, is a, they're seeking a variance for a parking variance only. So the parking variance would be from four parking spaces. They were asking originally f to go down to two but they've actually increased that to three. So they're looking for a variance to go from four to three. So what's before the zoning boards of, not a simple application, but it, it's, it's very limited. It's a limited application and they're just looking at the parking. There was a number of members of the public that came to that meeting and were speaking out against fast food in general. Which, and so what happened is, uh, as we know, East Chester's passed a law prohibiting fast food restaurants in their municipality. So this board's asked me, to look into what East Chester did. Um, so what I've, I've done that, and what happens is, so East Chester's passed a law basically prohibiting fast food and fast casual food, so they've kind of differentiated between those two things. Um, the, the key with the law is, it's really the legislative intent, because you can't, as a board, you can't act arbitrary and capricious. You can't just say, well, I don't like fast food. There has to be a reasoning behind your decision. And so what I did was uh, I want to kind of read what East Chester's re reasoning was in their legislative intent. It's, it's, it's actually quite lengthy, but I'm going to just read the pertinent part, which is the meat of it, where East Chester said, this is why we're going to prohibit fast food. Okay? Okay. So what that is, with that, it's basically, um, and this is from their legislative intent to that law. It says, to maintain and encourage diverse and vibrant commercial districts to avoid against generic and formulaic architecture and signage to encourage local economic development and eco economic vitality uh, through the support of, of a diversity of independent businesses and to support businesses that serve the basic needs of the community rather than those oriented towards regional shoppers and patrons. It goes on and says, within this context, the board finds that formula fast food and quick serve and formula fast casual quick casual restaurants which by their very nature have standardized services, decor, methods of operation, and generic corporate-driven architecture and other features that make them virtually identical to business elsewhere. And then it just goes on. So that's, that was their reasoning behind it. I also did some other research. Some of the other municipalities um, basically look at the, basically what Trustee Quigley was saying about the Gajumer was the health aspects of this. Um, you know, we don't want this in our community because of the health reasons. So that could be another reason if the board ever decides, you know, to pass a law similar to East Chester's. And what I'll also do is I'll go through and East Chester basically define this fast food. So I'll tell you what their definition of fast food was so we kind of know what we're talking about. Um, so what they said is formula fast food and formula quick serve restaurants basically share a common name, trademark, or logo with seven or more restaurants in the area region or country that are generally characterized by the following. So number one is food is intended to be prepared and served very quickly. Food is typically ordered at a stand-up counter and there is minimal or no table service. Number three, payment is typically made prior to consumption. Four, the menu is typically posted over the counter as well as a wall display and the menu selections are general, consist are general consistent at every location. Food is typically preheated or pre-cooked and kept hot or reheated to order. Uh, food is typically served to the customer in a packaged form for takeout, although uh, tables may be provided for consumption on premises. And then number seven, which is the last one, is plates, cups, and utensils are typically disposable. So that's what East Chester's passed. And it says uh, formula fast, quick service restaurants are prohibited within the town of East Chester. Mm. So that, that was their law and that was their reasoning for passing that law. So again, Subway's here for a variance be between the, uh, for the zoning board, but they are limited. They're not looking at any of this because the law, we don't have a law prohibiting fast food. Right. Um, 
So what they're really just looking at is this parking variance. So I just want to make the members of the community aware that um, they, they're, uh, the scope is very limited to what, what they're deciding. What about Bronxville? There, I, I watched the zoning board meeting and there was a uh, uh, couple of people made reference to East Chester and Bronxville having restrictions. I, I, I got halfway through Bronxville. Okay. I, don't, I don't have a full answer to that. I've been playing phone tag with the village administrator down there. Mm -hmm. um, I know they've defined fast food um, in their in their definition section of the code. I'm not sure. I, I just haven't been able to pinpoint where they prohibit it. So I know there's a whole bunch of districts down there. So I'm not sure if it's just a general prohibition or if it's just a specifically one area. But I'm still looking into the okay. Bronxville. All right, good. Um, I've got a question on the, on, I'm sure I understand the term parking variances. Uh, the locations on Main Street, parking is all metered parking there. What does it mean to have four or three parking spaces? W where are they located? Are they metered? Are they? Uh, they're not metered. Uh, they're provided by the landlord. I think the landlord has um, signed a lease for those parking spaces with, uh, I guess, Diagostino. Robert Diagostino had extra spots. These so are the those ones are on Cameron around the corner, or where would they? Uh, I'm just trying to figure I, I out. I think they're right next to the, the proposed subway. It's right, the I building right next door. Building. It's behind the building. Behind the, okay, Correct. Not, and, obviously and, not in Main and Street. And those parking spaces would basically be for the employees. Um, the uh, the applicants come in and said he's going to have generally between two and three employees. That's why he only really needs two or three parking spaces. So there, um, we haven't gotten to the planning board stage with the site plan, but I would assume that the customers would be either walking to the location or parking on uh, you know, Main Street to go there. But again, we haven't gotten that far um, into you know, the, how the, uh, the operation's gonna, gonna go. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna stay on this and uh, you're gonna have a little more information for us next month too? Sure, I'll, I'll you know, nail down Bronxville and uh, see what other communities are doing. Actually, just one last question. Sure. Say if we did pass some sort of a fast food law, that certainly is not going to apply to the subway application at this point, would it? If we, if we pass a law to ban it, which, which, you know, given the process, wouldn't come any earlier than, say, probably September of October of this year. In the meantime, uh, the subway just has to clear the variances and the parking, and it's ready to, to open up. You have to go through planning board, the site plan, too. Okay, so we pass the law in October, then what happens to the subway, if, assuming it goes in? They're open and oh, operating. They're in. Yeah, they're but, but, right. They're not closing. No. We're talking about future That's applications. Correct. Sure. That's correct. If, 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 if you would, Gary, um, talk a little bit about, I know you did, but I, this is something I really want to know about, which is the permissive uh, causes, so to speak, or the permissive um, uh, rationale that a village and or town can have to, for this banning and the non-permissive rationale well, or the arbitrary. Arbitrary and capricious is what you cannot act. You, you can't. And what has the court found to be arbitrary and capricious? If we, don't, we don't like fast food. That's arbitrary well, and that's capricious. That's arbitrary and capricious. Right? So we, it's going to be a case by case. So we have to say we don't like fast food because... Correct, because, and there has to be valid reasons, and it's going to vary because each community is going to be different. So we're going to have to look at our community and say, you know, X, Y, Z, and might be different than another community, but it just can't be arbitrary and capricious. There has to be some rationale behind your decision and, and why uh, you'd be against uh, fast food as defined, you know, as defined as, as an East Chester, whatever you want to define it as. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. I was just going to say maybe um, for some clarification for mine and Gary's uh, edification is that we need some direction from the board of the reasoning. Um, are you looking to get rid of fast food or you, do you not want chains in Tuckahoe? Do you not want the certain characters of certain buildings? Exactly. I guess maybe that's what we're trying to get is your legislative intent and what we're trying to do in Tuckahoe. Exactly for our community and what's best for our community. So that's what we're trying to pull out of you so we can craft a piece of legislation that's for us. You know, it's uh, difficult to say, and, and the reason why I say that is because we also had a town uh, hall meeting on this, and it was interesting. I, I thought an awful lot after that meeting. You know, there were some people there who said, hey, we hate Subway. We think it's going to bring in certain 
type of people or whatever. I don't know what the logic was there. And then uh, one of the residents brought up a point about um, the Panera Bread issue up on White Plains. And he said, although, you know, I kind of like Panera Bread. So I started thinking about it. I was like, all right, well, if I'm a legislator here, you know, where does my discrimination start and stop? You know, hey, I like Subway or I hate McDonald's. I mean, so it's it's very difficult. I, I guess we really need to, it, for the first time, we're looking at them in groups, in clusters. This is a fast food type business. These are franchises. Then you get into the whole, well, is it, um, I've heard, on both sides, well, it's a franchise. Yeah, but the franchise is owned by um, Greg Luisi, and he lives in Tuckahoe, and he's a nice guy. You know, he's raising a family here, and he, and he owns that Denny's restaurant, that Denny's franchise that's in Tuckahoe. So um, if I, you know, now do I say, well, hey, I don't want any Denny's, but I just kind of killed his whole, you know, lifelong plan of opening a an IHOP right on Marbledale Road or something like that. So it's... It, it, it's a big it's a big conversation I think that from my standpoint I don't really have an answer to your question right now and I believe mr. mayor uh, just to piggyback with what you said I believe the applicant is a Tuckahoe uh, I know he's yes. a Tuckahoe high school graduate yes, I, yes. I don't know if he's living the subway here now. guy the guy yeah, who owns the, the subway yeah yeah mm -hmm. and I and I know that the the public that attended the zoning board meeting that was expressing their displeasure with the subway was advised by members of the zoning board that they had to present their argument to this village board. That's correct. And uh, so to answer your question, David, is they're not here, so I don't feel it's an issue right now. Right. That's I, I mean, I have a statement prepared that I wanted to read, but there's nobody here. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be... but. Seeing as I did it, I am going to mention some of the points because I know there's people watching on TV. So, um. Well, actually, on this topic, since Gary opened it up, I'll ask, is there anybody from the public who would like to speak on this food, fast food issue? Anybody here? No. Okay, good. Right. So now it's probably very appropriate so, time. To so, what, what yeah. and Mayor, if I may, we, we all received, the, this board uh, received a communication from a resident from the Parkview Heights Civic Association. And uh, I'm just going to read some of the highlights of what she wrote to us. Tax revenue. You will sacrifice current revenue for short-term gains since you will, be, since you will inevitably lose some of the small shops. Two, village character and identity will be lost as each small mom and pop shop closes. Our village character's identity helps to keep property values up. Three, town ordinance prohibits fast casual food shops and she references East Chester. Traffic will increase. 45,000 vehicles per week pass along Main Street. And then number five, moratorium on subway application and similar applications. And I wrote back on behalf of the board that this was a worthy of discussion. Please attend this meeting and let's have this discussion. But no one's here. So I have a little something that I want to say. Comments like subway is not classy, and this has already been said, but I'm going to go on record as saying it. When a man dressed as the Statue of Liberty is hawking income tax business on the corner and that draws no public outcry, that causes me to take a step back and question what is the real issue at hand. When I leave my house in Armaville to walk up Lake Avenue and I pass two nail salons, one spa, and two hairdressers on the same block, and the only separation is a parking lot, I wonder, why is there no concern for the sustainability of these businesses by the public, like they have with the subway application? The question becomes even more pressing when I turn the corner on Main Street and I count two more hair salons and two more nail salons on Main Street between Columbus and Fairview Avenues. And then as the mayor just said, when a, when a resident in a meeting says, I support a Panera Bread, I question, well, why is that acceptable, but Subway's not? How much will this Subway 
affect surrounding similar businesses. This was brought up at the zoning board meeting. Will it help to complement the businesses at Villaggio's or at Cafe 72? Neither of these establishments offer a deli sandwich, so my initial reaction is yes. Did the opening of Starbucks cause any local businesses to go out of business? Should I infringe, or this board, infringe on free enterprise in Tucko by supporting a law against Tucko, against Subway, I'm sorry? Or should I allow people to make their own choices as to what food establishment they wish to patronize? Should I support a law that would allow a vacant store to sit empty instead of receiving sales tax revenue that would benefit the village? How many fast food establishments would open in Tuckahoe, and where would they set up shop? Would we become the new fast food mecca of Southern Westchester? Today, I mean, and this is a random thought, I was standing in front of the post office, the abundance of parking at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Main Street and Columbus Avenue was impressive. What was also impressive was the line of traffic that stretched from Columbus Avenue all the way up past Fairview. And in my conversation with this local business owner, I said, you know, I was thinking to myself, let me see how many of these cars are going to pull over and go to Villaggio's or Cafe 72. Well, needless to say, that did not happen. So I guess I'm starting to get to, is it wise for us, Tuckahoe, to plant its feet in the ground and not permit an established franchise to operate in the village? If the Marriott Hotel wants to open a franchise steakhouse on their premises, would it be sensible for this board to prohibit such an operation? All I'm trying to say here tonight is this is a, and Steve, Alf, Trustee Alfasi said this, as well as my other colleagues. We need to discuss this. But, and I'm going to say this a million times, we need to keep an open mind and not let our unfounded fears run this conversation. We have to do this in an objective manner to achieve a goal, whatever that goal might be. Thank you. Well, that's well said. Don't let the unfounded fears dictate and, and uh, run the whole conversation. You're 100% right there. Thank you. Just briefly, Mayor, uh, my direction to the uh, David Burke and to Gary Gertzen is um, don't do anything right now. Uh, I, I agree <laughs> very much <laughs> with, <hear> what <laughs> with what trust. No, not in this yeah. <laughs> I, at the risk of, of sounding like my Republican colleagues, uh, I agree, Mr. Oh, no. Luisi, that uh, this is competition and uh, survival of the fittest. This is what built the country, and I think that this is a matter of we should not be in a position uh, as a governmental body stifling honest, fair competition. Uh, so, uh, you know, at this point, I, I'm certainly open to discussion. If, if people in the public come in any subsequent meetings to talk about it, I'm certainly going to listen to them. Mm -hmm. But right now, I'm, I'm fine with just leaving things as they are. I think the one element that I'm uh, really uh, curious about is the Bronxville law, because if we happen to be in this little vacuum here between Bronxville and the town, you know, we may want to just take a look and see, is there something, I'm not saying that we're going to radically change anything, but um, if, I don't know, I just want to see if we just happen to be kind of, you know, fair game to everything, and maybe there's some, some level of restriction that we, we may want to put in place. I don't. I have no idea what that would be, but I want to see where Bronxville. I, I've uh, looked at East Chester, and I, I think they did a good job when they crafted that to specifically take care of their issue that they had at that time. Um, and that may that may very well change too. There may be a different mindset of of the uh, board, and they could change that as well. But uh, I think I'd like to see what Bronxville what they have on their books. You know, and another thing that, you know, that we discussed in our work session is, you know, as I mentioned, the nail salons. Um, should we look at, and I throw this out there for discussion again, should we uh, say that only certain X amount of businesses, a, a similar type of business can only operate within a certain radius? 
But it's free enterprise. This guy might be a better nail cutter than the, the guy down the block. It's not for me to say. I'm not the one investing the money. I wish them all the success in the world. And obviously, they're doing well because they're still here. And then I didn't even get past Fairview. There's another hair salon. So, I mean, think of how many hair salons. And, of course, as we all know, I know you're getting ready to say it. I won the three <laughs> raffles for the hair salon. So. Um, you know, it's also important to recognize, too, that um, somebody, they buy a building, and they put a million dollars into renovating it. And then, you know, we turn around and say, oh, guess what? You know what? We don't want you to have any food establishments in there. We're going to curtail and, uh, you know, put restrictions on it. So what do we do? You know, we, we took somebody, we took an old uh, a derelict building that somebody improved, set it up for a good tenant, and now uh, we're handcuffing and restricting his opportunity to go ahead and generate some income, which he obviously needs to do to pay for those repairs that he put on the building, which keeps our uh, community looking fresh and vibrant. So it's, uh, there's a lot of different forks to this, uh, no pun intended, uh, prongs to the fork um, uh, to this conversation. So, and um, as I will agree with my Democratic counterpart here, free enterprise is a very good thing. Um, you know, I own a small business, a uh, small scaffolding business, and, um, you know, I, I go back to when I first started in business, there was, believe it or not, there was maybe 10 scaffolding businesses in the New York area, and now there's 200. And yet, um, I'm still in business today. Um, is that because we do a, a good job? I want to think so. And there's a lot of people that I've seen <coughs> who opened and closed. Is it because they didn't do a good job? I would imagine so. So uh, that's just, that's the way it works, so. You know, piggybacking on that thought, Mr. Mayor, um, for those who, who, who might not like a uh, franchise to be open, whether that's Subways, whether that's McDonald's, whether it's Burger King, or any other franchise that you might think of, um, there's always the great power of the purse or the lack thereof, meaning if you don't want it, don't patronize it. I don't know that uh, in that, any business, uh, no business can survive if they don't have customers. I think that's enough said. Yep, very true. Well, that'll bring us to uh, our last department head, which is our village administrator, David Burke. Was there anything else? We, I know we heard a lot from you tonight. Anything yeah, maybe I'll just be really brief because um, even though we had a lot of discussion on a lot of different items tonight. I took up most of my month, some of these personnel issues, and, you know, we're still in the budget season. But maybe I just want to piggyback off the – we're looking for, uh, for the public feedback on some of these issues in regards to the term changes and some of this fat food stuff. And I'd be happy to disseminate the information to the board if people want to email me. Um, some people can't make it to the board meeting. Some people just want to say something. Um, if you want to email me, the public wants to email me, and I'll give it to the whole board. Obviously, your emails are online. Anyone can email you directly, but if they just want to send it to me, we're always looking for feedback from, from the public. Thank you. Yeah. Um, brings us to miscellaneous business, which is our next village board meeting. It is going to be on April 27th which will be the special budget adoption meeting as well. Um, May 6, 2015, we have a residence meeting down at Parkway Oval, and that is going to bring us to our Board of Trustees member reports, and we're going to start with Trustee Quigley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you might not know, but we are in the midst of National Library Week. began yesterday, continues through the end of this week. Uh, just a couple of some, I think, really interesting uh, events coming up. On uh, Thursday, this coming Thursday, April 16th, Gloria Goldreich, who wrote the book called The Bridal Chair, will be at the library. Uh, so you can just meet the author, book discussion and signing. That'll be April 16th at 2 o'clock. Uh, books and coffee, you heard that mentioned earlier during some of the uh, discussion about the library and the budget. Uh, that's Wednesday, April 22nd at 11 a.m. Uh, living successfully while maintaining your mental health. This will be a program presented by Sharon McCarthy of um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. That will be Friday, May 1st at 2 p.m. 
And uh, something very timely with the spring coming on finally, uh, growing and cooking with fresh herbs. It'll be a presentation, uh, how to grow your own herbs uh, by an expert from the Sprain Brook Nursery. Uh, Wednesday, May 20th, 6.30 p.m. Uh, you'll come home with uh, your own uh, herb seeds. Uh, there'll be a small uh, materials fee, uh, but a great way to get your summer garden going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trustee Luisi. I promise to keep this short, Mayor. The Tuckahoe Seniors will have a visit tomorrow at the uh, Father Father Hall by historian David Osborne from the St. Paul's Church National Historic Site, who will discuss World War I with the seniors. Then on April 16th, this Thursday, they will be traveling up to the Westchester Broadway Theater to take in the West Side Story as well as um, dinner. The calligraphy program is in full swing and is doing quite well. It's a new program that was initiated by uh, Jennifer Vetramile. And they are now are also undertaking a new program thanks to the generous donation of a Keller Williams. They are offering additional classes in line dancing and Tai Chi. And I'd like to once again remind everyone that the seniors are, the Tuckahoe Seniors are one of the, org, are the oldest organization in Westchester County as well as the Senior Council, who this year will be celebrating their 45th anniversary. And they will be doing this on June 18th up at the newly refurbished Lake Isle. I'll have more information for you uh, at next month's meeting. Moving on to the Tuckahoe History Committee, they are now undertaking a new um, recording process, and by that I mean they are interviewing the three business owners that survived urban renewal here in Tuckahoe. So they are going to be doing recorded audio histories with the owners of Tuckahoe Paint and Glass, Roma's Restaurant, and the owner of Epstein's. It will be interesting to have this recorded describing their growth and success here in the village. And of course, once these, uh, this project is completed, it will be available for everyone to come in and enjoy. As always, they welcome all residents to come and visit them on Wednesday when they are here on the second floor in Village Hall from the hours of 9 a.m. until noon. And that's all I have, Mayor. That will be a neat interview. Yeah. Yes, looking forward to that. Uh, Trustee Alfasi. Nothing this evening. Mr. And same with me. Nothing at all. We covered a lot of ground tonight. Uh, thank you for your patience. I don't think we've had a meeting this long in quite a while. So that's going to bring me to the second opportunity to address the board. Anybody want to talk about anything at all? And if there's no other business tonight, I will ask for a mo Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. Mr. Ringwall. Didn't mean to cut Thank you Thank you, Mr. So Mayor. Uh, no, I, I, I was a little late getting up. Uh, Tom Ringwall, 6 Hollywood Avenue. A uh, question about signage. I, I had written a note to uh, the village administrator, and I got a response. Quite frankly, I don't recall. When the board is going to meet about signage, in particular, I'm talking about neon signs. You have a new uh, place on Main Street, a nail salon. I went in to patronize them, and the lady said, it was a long time to open, yada, 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 and she'd love to put a neon sign up, but she's not allowed to. As we look across the street, directly in front of us is a neon sign that says, open. As I walked into Village Hall tonight above um, uh, Chase Bank, there is a neon sign flashing in my face on the end of, uh, over by the Pyramid Racquetball Place. There's a building. Uh, both levels have neon signs in, in the window. My question is this, if there's an ordinance, why is it not enforced? Why does it seem to be that it's selective and the new tenant can't put a sign up, but right across the street, they have a sign up? I think uh, the first question would be, what is the rule? And I'm gonna ask uh, I know that. Uh, Gary, who is, from my recollection on this is that a neon sign was allowed if it is back inside your business a yes. certain distance. You can't have a neon sign up against your front window. That's correct. Um, Gary's scanning through to there. Re right. And I haven't. We have I to give him a, we have to cut him some slack. 
Um, it may, it may take me a while to look at the right. code, but I, I had dealt with this in the court one time because I remember we did give somebody a violation for a neon sign, and I believe that was correct, that if, if the sign was set back, right. the neon was okay. But I haven't dealt with that in probably 10 years. Um, but I'll, I'll have to go through that. That's, and that's okay. But I think the second part is um, there's there's really no selective enforcement. We don't tell, of course, our our code enforcement or building inspector, hey, go go ahead and give this person a violation and this person not. It's it's more of um, when it's brought to the attention of that department, then uh, they'll actually prepare a ticket and they'll actually go on, or uh, re a uh, not a ticket, it's a form, and then they'll go out and actually do an inspection on it. So. Um, if you have an issue, you can uh, you know Bill now since you're on the zoning board. Just let him know, and he'll go ahead and and uh, address it with him. But um, look, the law's the law, and uh, if we as a board we decide that we want to go ahead and change that law and let everyone put neon signs right up against a plate glass window, then that's something that we'll address and take up. But opposed? Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I, I I figured that too. So, um, but so I guess two parts is exactly what are they allowed to do? And I know neon is allowed inside the business. I'm not sure how far back. And um, in terms of if somebody does have it up against the window, then we're going to have to take action on that. Well, interestingly enough, this was brought to my attention a while back by uh, a store owner on Main Street, saying, "Why can't I have my neon sign?" when um, the store on the corner of Fairview has the New York State lottery sign. Well, lo and behold, New York State law supersedes village law, and they have to have, if they sell lottery tickets, correct me if I'm wrong, my crack legal team over here, that they are, they are obligated to have that sign in the window when they sell lottery tickets. And it wasn't a satisfying answer for her, but, uh, you know, Our why can they have one? Why can't I have one? So it's the difference. Our village attorney will, within the day or two, he'll send us all a memo on that exact point. So thank you. Thank yeah, you for bringing have our something attention. To do. But David's chomping. <laughs> sure. Uh, um, I just wanted to kind of. <laughs> skated on the fast food, but now you got the, got the neon signs. Um, in regards to the neon signs, and I did have an email conversation with Mr. Ringwald about this. It, um it's a couple of things where we're going to we were looking for direction from the village board on some of this stuff because it was um, should we be enforcing it closely? Should we not be enforcing it, uh, um, enforcing it very closely? Um, it is on our agenda to talk with um, Mr. Uh, uh, Trustee Alfasi on his uh, kind of his zoning issues where we would then kind of look at it more closely to see if this is the direction the board really wants to go in. The sign and awning board has actually also been looking at the sign and awning code to do some revisions to that. And it was also waiting on that, those revisions to come in. Obviously, those will go to the board if you guys want to do any of those modifications. But at that time, I thought maybe it would be appropriate to bring that topic up to get clear direction on some of these neon signs. And it's good to bunch them all together because there's a yeah. cost. in Anytime we go ahead and make a change to our village code, there's a pretty good cost. Mm -hmm. And it's ridiculous. The, uh, well, the public notice, I get that. You know, the notice in the paper. But then the printing and um, all the pages that uh, we have to print for the, the big manual, that, that big book, and then you have to have them available for anyone who wants to come in to the clerk's office. So I know there's a, an expense to actually make a change in our village ordinance. So it's good to not do it every week or every month. It's good to kind of bunch some of these issues together. And it, it's true. If the sign and awning was going to look at everything about signs and, and, and make some of those changes, let's just do them all at once. Let's oh, yeah. figure out what we don't want to do or what we do want to do. What else Just are they once. looking at besides sign? Uh, well, another thing we had been talking about is the uh, temporary banners right. and uh, by for-profit mm -hmm. uh, businesses, and that's something that um, mm -hmm. I've worked in some legislation, and we're we're going to get around to discussing that as well. Yeah, I can, I can. That's it for that. Well, anybody else? It's been a high-spirited meeting tonight. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, if there is no other business tonight, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Till next time, Tuckahoe, have a very good evening. <laughs>